Good morning and welcome to our devotion as we begin our Thursday. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. In the morning, O Lord, you hear my voice. In the morning, I prepare a sacrifice for you and watch. My mouth is filled with your praise. And with your glory all the day. O Lord, open my lips. And my mouth will declare your praise. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. We'll consider today John 6, verses 1 to 15. After this, Jesus went away to the other side of the Sea of Galilee, which is the Sea of Tiberias, and a large crowd was following him because they saw the signs that he was doing on the sick. Jesus went up on the mountain, and there he sat down with his disciples. Now the Passover, the feast of the Jews, was at hand. Lifting up his eyes then and seeing that a large crowd was coming toward him, Jesus said to Philip, Where are we to buy bread so that these people may eat? He said this to test him, for he himself knew what he would do. Philip answered him, Two hundred denarii worth of bread would not be enough for each of them to get a little. One of his disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, said to him, there is a boy here who has five barley loaves and two fish, but what are they for so many? Jesus said, have the people sit down. Now there was much grass in the place, so the men sat down, about 5,000 in number. Jesus then took the loaves, and when he had given thanks, he distributed them to those who were seated, so also the fish as much as they wanted. And when they had eaten their fill, he told his disciples, Gather up the leftover fragments that nothing may be lost. So they gathered them up and filled 12 baskets with fragments from the five barley loaves left by those who had eaten. When the people saw the sign that he had done, they said, This is indeed the prophet who is to come into the world. Perceiving then that they were about to come and take him by force to make him king, Jesus withdrew again to the mountain by himself. <laughs> Before Christ miraculously fed the people, he began to teach them many things, and he spoke about the kingdom of God. Christ's sermon about his glorious kingdom seems to have made a deep impression on the people. They probably thought that the only reason he did not want to establish that kingdom immediately was because he feared he would, not, he would have no subjects. They therefore wanted to use force to seize Christ, to declare themselves as his subjects, and to make him their king. That, that this was foolish needs no proof, for Christ did not allow himself to be seized by them, but quickly departed to a mountain. It is clear that the whole intention was a work and counsel of the flesh, and thoroughly contrary to the sense of Christ. All Christians certainly recognize this. However, most of them still commit the same foolishness displayed by the hearers of Christ in today's text. There the foolishness began when they wanted to seize Christ and make him their king. They were without repentance and without conversion, but they thought that by mere outward confession and clinging to Christ, they became and were his subjects. How differently do most so-called Christians think and act now? They are baptized they understand that Christ must really be the Savior of the world and confess this openly when they go to church and receive Holy Communion. By this, they think they have made Christ their king and have become his subjects. But they too are deluded. Christ no more lets himself be seized and made a king by people today than he did at the time of the incident described in our text. The manner of entering into the kingdom of Christ is entirely different from that of entering into a kingdom of this world. A person enters into an earthly kingdom by coming to the place where the kingdom is situated. He is then recognized as a citizen of that kingdom when he swears the oath of citizenship, pays homage to the king, obeys the laws of the land, pays his tax, and perhaps when necessary, joins the military and fights for the defense of the kingdom. The king and his officials do not inquire about the state of the heart of the person who does all of this. 
It is completely different in the case of Christ's kingdom. This is an invisible, spiritual, heavenly kingdom, a kingdom of hearts and souls. It is everywhere. Therefore, a person can be everywhere in this kingdom and yet remain outside it. Wherever a person may find himself, he can enter into the kingdom of Christ. But wherever that person may go, he never passes through into this kingdom or comes closer to it. One does not enter into this kingdom by any outward means, but only by receiving a new heart. Everything external either does not belong in this kingdom or is only a means that should work the change of the heart by which a person is incorporated into this kingdom. Moreover, a person does not come into this kingdom by any work. He may work earnestly for this kingdom, offer many gifts for it, fight for it, suffer and endure much for it, and even let himself be burned for it. But if he does not have that new changed heart, he would be a tool a worker and a mercenary rather than a member, a subject and a citizen of this kingdom. Wherever there are hearts in which the rule of sin has been replaced by the rule of Christ, in which he has truly placed his throne and in which he directs and governs by his spirit, there and only there is Christ's kingdom. Therefore, the one who has not experienced this changed heart or the one who has lost it is no citizen of the kingdom of Christ. And whoever wants to be exactly like those who in a foolish way wanted to seize Christ and make him their king are engaged in a vain effort. When Jesus comes, O oh blessed story, he works a change in heart and life. God's kingdom comes with power and glory to young and old, to man and wife. Through sacrament and living word, faith, love, and hope are now conferred. Amen. And let us pray. Almighty God, merciful Father, who created and completed all things, on this day when the work of our calling begins anew, we implore you to create its beginning, direct its continuance, and bless its end, that our doings may be preserved from sin, our life sanctified, and our work this day be well-pleasing to you, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. And we pray together. I thank you, my Heavenly Father, through Jesus Christ, your dear Son, that you have kept me this night from all harm and danger. And I pray that you would keep me this day also from sin and every evil, that all my doings in life may please you. For into your hands I commend myself, my body and soul and all things. Let your holy angel be with me, that the evil foe may have no power over me. Amen. Let us bless the Lord. Thanks be to God. Thank you for joining us for our devotion. The Lord be with you throughout the day ahead.